Hello Spartans, my name is Dave Isbell and I am the Assistant Director of Alumni Professional Enrichment at the MSU Alumni Association. It's my great honor to welcome you to today's presentation, Managing Your Career Transitions. Before I introduce you to our presenter, I just want to point out to you the chat window on the left side of your screen. This is where you can type your questions, which we'll be sure to answer by the end of the presentation. Also, all of our webinars are recorded and can be found at SpartansHelpingSpartans.com. For information about upcoming webinars and other events, please visit us at alumni.msu.edu slash lens. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce you today's pre presenter, Kieran Reef. Any form of communication should reflect the very best of you. This is one of Kieran's tenets of belief as she works as a strategist. Kieran specializes in crafting your unique career story. Whether the format is resume, cover letter, personal brand statement, LinkedIn profile, career biography, interview talking points, or more. She also specializes in coaching you to be completely confident, whether it's interviewing, negotiating, preparing for a meet and greet, or how to express your unique value in a sentence or two. Her credentials include Academy Certified Resume Writer, Master Career Counselor, Certified Job and Career Transition Coach, Global Career Development Facilitator, Licensed Professional Career Counselor, and she's also a published author and blogger. Karen takes the time to uncover your strengths, personality, accomplishments, and goals, and transform them into tools for your career management toolkit. She provides product services designed to help you get the interview, get found on LinkedIn, easily communicate in interviews, and help you clarify your personal brand and unique value to recruiters and employers. Karen offers a wide range of services for all motivated job seekers at any stage in their career, newly graduated, mid-career transition, returning to work, or career change. Having been a highly successful career management coach and strategist for over 20 years, people know Karen as inspirational, high energy, and creative. She likes to think of herself as the great connector of your dots, with the ability to translate your thoughts and words with impact and results for you. Karen received her Bachelor of Science degree from Western Michigan and her Master's degree from Michigan State University. She's an international consultant, an avid runner, bicycle, bicyclist, and cross-country skier and fitness junkie. With that, I'd like to thank you so much, Karen, for being here, and we look forward to hearing what great words of wisdom you have for us. Thanks, Dave. That was quite an introduction. I appreciate it. I'm so glad to be here today. Thanks for the amazing opportunity to discuss this really important topic. What you can expect from today's webinar, I always like to tell people exactly what the takeaway is at the very beginning so that you can say, oh yeah, I got that takeaway or maybe I didn't get that takeaway. Um, when I think about managing your career transition, I really think about understanding the definition of what career management really is. And here's the definition on the slide. It's a lifelong, self-monitored process of career planning that involves choosing and setting goals, formulating strategies for achieving them, and then documenting your success along the way. And I am an avid, avid proponent of having career management competencies and skills, which we're going to be talking about today. Um, we're going to actually have you do a little self-assessment of 27 competencies for your career management toolkit. So you can either do this as, as we go along, or you can take some time later and reflect upon each and every one of these competencies. So here we go. First of all, why do we really need to have career management skills? I have a job. I like my job. I don't think I want to change my job. Well, the short answer is change is constant. What happens today is not going to be happening tomorrow. The, um, you need to manage your career and your career transition um, due to the critical changes that are affecting you um, each and every day. And there's five on the slide, there's probably more, but I like to think of them as um, um, the most important ones. And I like to also think about the quote, even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. So whether you're on the right track or you're not on the right track, if you're sitting around not doing anything and you're on the tracks, you're going to get run over. Um, so the critical changes that are affecting you and I right now are things like technolo technological change, uh, 
um, this integration of a global economy. We are now international. We're not just competing in Michigan against people in California. We're competing against people across the globe for jobs, etc. Um, organizations are flattening and downsizing. And then there's huge demographic changes. Um, baby boomers, for example, are going to be retiring soon. And there are now as many millennials as there are baby boomers. Then there's also changes in organizational roles. And you probably know this as well as anybody else. There's an increased use of contract and, fl and flex workforce. Just briefly, I want to talk a little bit about traditional career paths. You know, you may be in a situation where you're following either traditional career path one or traditional career path two. The first one on the left is kind of that up the ladder of success kind of career path. It's really the organization's de organizational definition of career success. You, it's based on upward progress, your position in the hierarchy of the organization. And that's kind of what defines your success. The second traditional career path is kind of that expert career path, which focuses on being highly competent in a specific kind of work. Engineer, computer programmer, doctor, lawyer. You have specific subject matter content. And a lot of people consider this, quite frankly, to be kind of the only definition of success. But there are two emerging, new and emerging career paths. And I'd like you to think about, in your career so far, what career path you might be along. Um, there's one called spiral. And this is really where success means a progressive broadening of your knowledge and your skills over time. In other words, you're intentionally learning and growing and broadening your knowledge and your skills of your occupation, of your industry, over a series of time. And it's a pattern of movement that not only uses your old skills, but it adds new ones to it. Um, then the other one is this transitory career path, which really focuses on diversity of experience, where you may or may not be doing similar kinds of work from year to year or from every two years to every two years. And you may or may not even transfer skills. Um, some people mistakenly think of this as not even really having a career. But it would be like um, working for an advertising agency and then deciding you want to become a chef. Well, certainly, um, it's diverse. There may be similar skills that you use. There may be not. What I really, really hope you think about is um, that you are a company of one. Um, which is why I put the little logo on the very bottom of this slide. Being a company of one means you are the captain of your own ship. You are your own marketing person. You own your career. You manage your career. You are the engineer of your career. You are your own career agent. Because if you aren't in charge, who else is going to be? So. When you're, not in, when you're not in charge, who's really minding your store? This is sort of a shift in thinking. So you are not necessarily owned by your organization. You own your own knowledge, your skills, your achievements, your vision. And that, that can be portable and transferable and very, very valuable to other people. So let's begin with the assessment. Um, this is something that I put together uh, myself after years and years of working with a whole lot of different clients. It's divided into three categories. There's self-management skills, tech and social media management skills, and then communication management skills. And we're going to be going through each one of these uh, point by point. And as I said earlier, if you'd like to think about those on a scale, well, think about those as we go along, or reflect upon them afterwards, it's completely up to you. Um, so when we go through those, I'd also like you to think about them on a Likert scale of, say, 1 to 5. So ask yourself if you've got this competency or not on a scale of 1 to 5, 1 being I really need assistance with this one, and maybe 5 uh, being I've got this one really nailed. 
So the first category is, is self-management, and it's almost a misnomer because it's sort of a too general of a category title. <clears throat> but this is really all about knowing yourself. So as you can see on the slide, it's things like, I know what motivates me in the workplace, and I know what doesn't motivate me in the workplace. I can identify my strongest ability and skills. It's amazing how many people I work with that can't articulate what, their, what skills they have, what abilities they have, and what they might be able to offer to an organization, to an employer, or start their own business. Uh, number three, I have seven major achievements that clarify a pattern of interests and abilities that are relevant to me in my job and my career. People don't tend to think about what they've achieved or what they've accomplished. It's important to be able to know these things because if you don't know them, I won't know them, nobody else will know them. Um, I have a well-defined career objective that focuses my job search on either particular organizations, different employers, different industries. Um, you can't proceed through career transition if you don't have a well-defined target. Number six, I know what skills I can offer employers. If someone asks you, well, what can you offer me? What's your unique value proposition? And you say, I really don't know. That's the wrong answer. So you really need to understand what you can offer. It's more of uh, the environment these days of selling me instead of just telling me. Uh, number seven, I can list major accomplishments in, in action-oriented terms. Whenever you promote yourself, you need to be able to show energy and movement. And the best way we do that is we talk in verbs. We talk in action terms. Um, the eighth one I can identify and target employers I would like to interview. Um, many people don't even have a sense of where they might want to go and who they might want to talk to in terms of possibilities either in that industry or in that occupational area. I can gain support of family and friends for making a career transition. There are some clients that I work with who don't have the support of their significant other or their friends to make a career transition. It, it, takes, it takes more than one, one person who's interested in, in making that career transition. It takes some folks who can help support and guide you along the way. And then number 10, um, being able to understand how much time and energy it does take to secure a job. And folks, it is very, very true that it's much easier to find a job when you have a job. In fact, there's a lot of research out now that talks about employers having a big bias uh, against people who are not actually employed. Um, this is a bit new, uh, and it's one of the trends. I think it's going to continue to be to be the case. So the second category, I think the millennial generation has a much better handle on this category than um, the baby boomer generation. Um, but it is amazing the clients that I work with that, that do not, that are not able to demonstrate these six competencies. Uh, number one on the list, I have a complete LinkedIn profile. I'll say this once and I'll say it again later on in the webinar, but if you're not on LinkedIn, you do not exist. That's not my quote. That's a quote from lots of recruiters that I've talked to. It's important to have a LinkedIn profile, but it's got to be a complete LinkedIn profile. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. I can demonstrate proficiency in Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. This is absolutely the basic minimum for computer skills that you must possess. Um, you might be laughing now saying, oh my gosh, I know that. That's, you know, who doesn't have those, who, who doesn't have those skills? I can assure you there are many, many people that don't have the basic proficiency in Microsoft Office. Number three, I can demonstrate use of Twitter and Facebook. More and more employers and more and more recruiters are using Twitter and Facebook to source talent as long, as, as well as, a, as LinkedIn. So you need to get on Twitter and make sure your Facebook uh, account is acceptable for business professionals. Uh, I know how to search and apply for a job online. There's protocols for that. Um, 
there's major pitfalls and there's lots and lots of tips that you can follow that I'll be covering in next week's webinar about how to apply for jobs online and what to do when they ask you to upload a resume. I can text and I know how to attach a file. Um, I almost didn't put this on but I've been working with a lot of mid-career professionals in transition who are getting displaced from the careers that they've had for over 20 years and to a person none of them know how to attach a file to an email <laughs> so there's lots of people that don't know how to do that and then the last one I can save attachments again kind of a basic proficiency but it's very very important when you're trying to transition uh, to another to another position The last category is probably the longest and I can't say that it's the most important because they're all really, really important and they build on themselves. But good communication management is absolutely a must for your career management toolkit. I know how to introduce myself for job seeking purposes. This is what we might normally call a pitch or an elevator speech or in answer to, you know, what are you looking for? tell me a little bit about yourself, you need to have a good, strong, snappy pitch. Some people have no idea how to craft that. I know how to cold call, and I will add, and I feel comfortable cold calling. Uh, nobody feels comfortable cold calling, but there are tips and techniques and scripts that can be developed to be able to cold call and be successful. I know how to communicate via LinkedIn. Again, there's protocols and scripts that can be developed to communicate with professionals who you'd like to connect with or have a professional relationship with using LinkedIn as your, um, as your go-to. I know how to solicit, secure, and succeed in informational interviews. Informational interviews are absolutely critical. Um, it's a great way to, to do networking. It's a great way to collect information, uh, particularly if you're changing careers um, or you're relocating, that kind of a thing. And then I have an up-to-date resume that clearly demonstrates my achievements. And we're going to talk in depth about that next week. But that is absolutely what you have to have. And when I say up-to-date, I mean up-to-date. And when I say achievements, I mean you need to quantify, quantifiable terms, what your successes and your accomplishments are. Um, being able to know how to follow up on job interviews and things like post-network events is really, really critical. I was talking to a client yesterday and she said, I applied for a job in December and I haven't heard from them yet and I'm just waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And my response was, you need to follow up. Everybody needs to follow up. Um, and the reason why everyone needs to follow up is because a lot of people don't follow up and the squeaky wheel often gets the grease. Um, I know what to say when asked, tell me about yourself, and I can clearly articulate and specify why um, employer, an employer should hire me. This can be scripted, this can be practiced, and there should be no excuse for you not being able to talk about your greatest strengths um, in a way that can convince people that you could add value to their organization. I know how to write an executive summary of my qualifications. By this I mean a short um, one page or less uh, synopsis of your greatest strengths and qualifications for a specific position that you want to go after. I can develop my own brand statement, something very short, maybe a tagline that captures the essence of you. Again, if you're a community of one, you need to be able to be your own ad company, right? I can develop at least five power stories. Uh, when I say power stories, I mean being able to quantify and qualify my achievements and my successes using either a car format or a star format. Car format is, you know, just as it says on the slide, challenge, action, result. What challenge did I face? what kind of action did I take, and what were the results of my action. You need to have five or six or seven of these stories in your back pocket at any given point in time to be able to talk to people about your achievements. 
um, being able to discuss salary requirements and comfortably negotiate a salary is something that a lot of people are really, really leery of. But there is a, uh, a finesse way of discussing what you require and also even negotiating something uh, above what the employer initially offers. So again, there's uh, tips and strategies and techniques that you can learn um, to be able to do this with finesse. Here's some more that I found recently that I think are really, really important for you to consider also. While you're going about your business at your work, I want you to think about the following things. Do you regularly read professional or industry-based materials? If not, you need to. You need to keep up to date because, as we said earlier, change is constant. Have you gathered feedback about your performance? Do you know what others think of you and the work that you do? Are you an active member? Have you belonged to, do you belong to a professional group or organization, even if it's on LinkedIn, for example? Do you have LinkedIn groups that you belong to? Things like, have you presented seminars or participated in committees in the past year? If so, yes, document that. Tell me how many, what type, how long the seminar was, what the content was, how many people participated, etc. Um, this is the next one is something that is absolutely critical. Um, do you regularly update yourself on trends and changes that are going to affect everybody, and just or your just or your organization or your state or your community? Um, if you don't do that, you really need to. You need to stay ahead of this because again, you're the CEO of your own company. And then the last one, which is sort of at the heart of everything, I think, is do you honestly believe in yourself um, and in your ability to survive whatever changes may come your way? If it's, a, if it's a sudden job change, if it's something that came completely unexpected or something that you're getting ready to do, do you honestly believe in yourself and your abilities, your skills, knowledge, knowledges, and attitudes that you can survive and weather the storm? Because if you can say yes, you've got a great career management toolkit. So how did you do? Which specific area do you think you need the most work with? Maybe you have a few here and a few there, maybe none. If you don't have any concerns, that's great. You've got a great career toolkit to take you along your way as the architect, the engineer of your own career. So we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about where you can find jobs and something about uh, this notion called the hidden job market. Okay, I hear people tell me all the time, there are no jobs, there are no jobs, there are no jobs in my field. And if you listen to the media, in fact, if you've been listening to the media for the past four or five years, the media often tells us there aren't any jobs either, right? Well, I'm here to tell you, there are always jobs. At any one given point in time, there are at least a million and a half jobs every month. There are always jobs. Why are there always jobs? People retire. People relocate. People die. People change careers. So there's replacement needs, and there's also growth. So if the industry or the occupational area is growing, then there are more jobs. So there are always jobs. Don't let anybody tell you that there are no jobs. Even in the worst of times, there are jobs. But 80% of them are not advertised. So where are they? Well, they're in what's called the hidden job market. Um, Here's some sources of leads that are pretty low percentage, but you know some people do ad, advertise in ads, very few. Uh, lots of job boards, people, people love to go to job boards, but the, the job leads at job boards um, and the chances of success are less than 5% um, if you just apply anonymously to a job board. And the reason should be obvious. Number one, they don't know you. Uh, and number two, there's probably a million other people that are applying for the same job. Uh, and number three, if you don't know which resume format to upload, then your resume might fall into a big black hole. Um, if you look at the chart on the slide, there's really four stages of job openings. Um, and the trick is to get um, 
to get an understanding of where the jobs are in the first couple of stages because the farther out you go into the fourth stage the ads then ad the, the ads either in the paper on the job board or in some other place and then everybody and their brother is coming out to apply for the job so the first stage is um, there's no actual official job opening but employers are always looking for good workers so we're moving into this notion of networking which I'm going to talk about in a minute but if you know people inside organizations um, they they can help you find job leads before job openings even even exist the second stage is when the need is clear the insiders know there's going to be a job openings but there's no action that's being taken quite yet um, people get jobs where none are open and up to the second stage you're really just competing with yourself so as I said earlier as time passes more people become you know know more about the the job and um, more people apply so you're better off finding people who can tell you about possibilities inside either their organizations or other places that they might know about as I said we're moving into that networking word when I say networking is the single most important activity you can do, people often shudder. Oh, I hate networking. Well, who doesn't? I ask. It sounds utterly unfun, right? The way we normally look for work, though, is the exact opposite from the way employers look. So think about it. We normally think about work where we start with, I have to have my resume done. I have to have my resume done. Employers start looking for talent with relationships. And by the way, the, the most recent research on referrals is, is very, very strong. Referrals are, are, are quickly becoming the most popular way for employers to find talent. If somebody from the inside refers somebody else. Um, so be thinking about that too. I want you to break all the rules that you learned as a kid. For example, don't bother people. Don't be pest. Don't be a pest. Don't ask for favors. Don't toot your own horn. You know we've taught we've been we've been taught to be humble. Don't. Uh, avoid a rejection at all cost, you know, follow the proper channels, etc. Because if you do, you're going to be left on the train tracks. So you have to break all those rules. You need to connect with people. You do need to ask for favors. You do need to to toot your own horn. And rejection is the way you get a, um, an acceptance. Um, you don't necessarily even have to follow the proper channels. Again, remember, you're your own company. You're your own manager. It's human nature, I don't know if you really know this or not, but it's human nature that everybody wants to help other people. So think about that when you think about, oh my gosh, I don't really want to network. And also think about this, your network is your net worth. And the person who I can attribute that quote to is the uh, founder of the career website, Career Realism. Uh, which I'm going to reference at the end of this webinar, but her main um, premise in uh, career management is your network is your net worth. And it's important to adopt uh, a marketing mindset. Informational interviews is a really great way to um, to connect. It's really part of your super connection, super connecting activities. The purpose uh, of informational interviewing is really to A, learn more about the person and B, better serve them in super connection. So it's all about relationships. Um, it's not um, I ask and you give. It's I get to know you. We form a relationship on LinkedIn, for example, through a professional group. We get to know each other and we share ideas and information. And so it's a mutual, uh, mutual professional 
networking. When I talk about cold calling, which we all sometimes need to do, um, I suggest for those of you who just cringe at the word cold call to start with your warm contacts first. By warm contacts, I mean people like your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues, your former employers, your folks you went to college with, um, etc. Start with them and then move to cold contacts second. And for cold contacts, I, I suggest finding out more about the companies uh, that you might be interested in and talking to them, again, using a script, because you don't have to do this um, without using a script. Um, make sure that you've targeted specific companies that you'd like to find more out about, and then contact them for informational interviews, or what I like to call field research. And as I said, you need a script. Um, scripts are great because you can write them in advance. And if you're talking to them on the phone, you can almost read them. So um, low, uh, everybody's out of their comfort zone when they're doing this. But it's, uh, it's really a, a no fail, a no fail activity. Now, social media is absolutely critical to your job search. As I mentioned earlier, LinkedIn, if you're not on LinkedIn, you don't exist. It is the professional network site. We're going to be talking more about LinkedIn and the various sections of LinkedIn uh, next week. But it, uh, it is said that 95%, I think it's closer to 100% now. Um, and this, this data is very fresh, about a month old. Uh, of all recruiters and employers use LinkedIn as their primary source of to find their talent. Primary. So if you're not there, you can't be found. I had a client I was speaking with this morning who said, well, my husband is a IT, is a professional in the IT world, and said he would never, ever get a LinkedIn profile. And he advised me strongly not to get a LinkedIn profile. And so I told her exactly what I just said. If you're not on LinkedIn, you don't exist, and you can't be found. So use the power of social media to help you in your career management job search process. Um, what does it mean to have a complete profile? You have to have a complete profile for employers to find you. If you don't, employers can't find you. So what does that exactly mean? Well, first and foremost, it means you have to have a professional picture. You have to have a professional headshot. If you do not have a headshot, if you do not have a picture, um, recruiters will not, will not find you. Uh, seems to be a protocol uh, for recruiters. You need to have a specific headline under your name that is not your title. Because again, if you're a company of one, you're not necessarily the sum total of a job title, right? You are a set of skills. So I highly suggest, and I'll talk about this more next week, that your headline be specific skill sets and or a brand statement or a tagline that best describes you. So at a minimum, a professional headshot, a specific headline, and a summary. Um, if you do not have these three items, employers won't find you. And a summary is, um, is a great way to write a first person story about what makes you so um, talented and valuable to an organization. And you actually get 2,000 characters. So there's a lot of content that can be written about, your, about yourself in the summary. And then from there, it goes to uh, experience. And you can add lots of other bells and whistles, too. It's really important also to keep in mind that you're going to need to start collecting recommendations. People with recommendations are more sought after on LinkedIn than people without. Twitter, as I mentioned earlier, is quickly becoming a new place to find talent. Uh, as you all know, probably uh, Twitter has a 140 character maximum. Um, and just as a homework assignment, I teach a class in career development um, for another local university. And as a homework assignment, I have my students develop a brand statement with only 140 characters to keep it at, at the Twitter maximum. So that might be something that you might be um, interested in challenging yourself on. Facebook, um, 
I know we probably all have Facebook. Um, I think what I'll say about Facebook is simply that employers will always check out your Facebook page prior to making any kind of offer. They want to find out who you are, what kind of personality you are, what kinds of likes and dislikes you have, how you portray yourself in social media. And it's actually becoming popular with recruiters to even find talent there. So you have LinkedIn, you have Twitter, you have Facebook, and there's, there's more, but these are the most popular ones. Um, what I suggest, um, because you really need to make sure that you have a positive online reputation, I suggest you Google yourself. In other words, put your name in the search engine, in the Google search engine, and see what comes up. We want to see positive, um, positive information about you when you Google yourself. If you have any kind of negative information about you, you need to attend to that immediately. And just briefly, a few more LinkedIn features in case you're not familiar with LinkedIn. Some of you probably are, are very, very familiar and have well-established profiles. Uh, but besides establishing a network for, for job search and then just general professional connections and relationships, um, LinkedIn has a lot of other features. Um, first and foremost, I need to tell you it is totally keyword-based. If, for example, I wanted to find a um, paralegal in Fort Wayne, Indiana, um, I could put in paralegal, I might put in bankruptcy, I might put in hot docs, which is a software program, I might put in um, court as keywords, and then I, I might be able to find the people who have those keywords in their LinkedIn profile who live in the Fort Wayne area. So everything is keyword based on LinkedIn. Recruiters find you based on keywords. Um, your profile should have the keywords of your uh, career path, career, career area, and industry. Uh, and if not, uh, you, need, you can't be found. Um, you can also search for jobs. You probably know this on LinkedIn. You can search for people on LinkedIn. You can search for companies. You can do research. Um, on any given con company. You can find people you know you can, that you can connect with on LinkedIn. Um, you can connect with interesting groups. You can find MSU alumni um, who work at specific companies. You can read lots and lots and lots of interesting articles. You can also post, post articles, share articles. You can share events, projects. You can share your accomplishments on there. Um, so you can do lots and lots of things on LinkedIn. It's absolutely an invaluable um, source, resource, source and resource. So briefly developing your pitch. How are you going to do that? Well, think like a marketer. Um, we used to call this an elevator speech. I don't know if that's all, all that popular of a, of a term these days. But developing your pitch. First and foremost, like anything, you have to know what you want. You have to have a focus and you have to have a target. If you don't know what you want, you're not going to be able to promote yourself. So it needs to be crisp and clean and targeted and very, very, very focused. Um, a good pitch has no more than three strong facts in it. And tell something about you. In, in other words, you want them to invest in you. So a pitch tells them a little bit about you. Uh, personality-wise, kind of who you are as a person, and also what kinds of skills and abilities you bring. Oops. Tell something about your career. It clearly tells what you're looking for, and it's got good energy and movement. It's important to, again, use those action-oriented terms because it is important to make it feel snappy and, um, and enthusiastic. It doesn't necessarily ask for a job. It's really just a short, interesting, very short, very interesting story about yourself. And this is the kind of thing that can be used for networking um, or specific interest in a specific job. So lots and lots of uses for your pitch.
And it's delivered conversationally. So it would be like me talking to a friend of mine. Uh, as I said, has good energy, probably uses smile, can't hurt. Um, but only you know what fits the particular situation. So you might want to alter it a little bit if you're going to a networking event or um, if you're talking to the cashier at the grocery store. That in any situation, positive energy is, is really always a plus. So here's, a, here's kind of a formula for you. Um, you don't have to use this, um, but this will just get you started. Hello, my name is blank. I'm a blank and talk a little bit about what you do. My strengths and interests are in, and this is where you talk about your value. Um, I'd love to have an opportunity to speak with you. And here's one that I just made up. Hi, my name is Matt Fister. I'm a packaging engineer for seven years, and I have a lot of experience in the medical device industry, especially international packaging protocols. I've had extensive experience with FDA testing and documentation, and I'm really, really eager to discuss opportunities at Genentech Industries with you. Might be a little long, but and not probably not as catchy and snappy as, as you might want to craft yours, but you probably get the picture. Very simple, um, and again, it can be scripted in advance and practiced and practiced and practiced and perfected too, and adapted to the uh, occasion. Personal brand statement, kind of similar to a pitch, only more like a tagline. So this is also going to be useful. Actually, I've had more and more clients want me to put their brand statement right on their resume, maybe right underneath their name. Um, so something that really captures you in, in uh, very few words. So one or two sentences describing your value and uniqueness, um, memorable, <laughs> maybe not so an eight-year-old could understand it, but something very short and snappy. Providing simple solutions to your complex problems. I inspire change and empower success. I help brand your ambitions. Helping navigate you through familiar territory. Something like that. Lots to think about, right? <laughs> we'll talk more about that uh, next week also. Then we come on, come upon probably the hardest question uh, for everyone to answer, and that's that whole tell me about yourself question. I like to call that the killer question. Uh, tell me about yourself really means, why should I hire you? What is it about you? that makes me want to just jump up and offer you make, and make you a job offer, OK? So it's the hardest question, but the easiest to answer if you're prepared. And again, it can be all scripted in advance. And this is the part of the intentional, continuous planning and documenting that you're going to be doing as part of your career management uh, toolkit. Um, again, you can't answer this if, if you haven't identified why you're the best person for the job. And really, you have to believe it. And then in terms of resumes and executive summaries, again, only way you can write it or have somebody else write it is if you've established a focus, if you know your keywords, and you've got kind of a pitch and a brand statement in your head. Um, one of the things I always ask people to do is to talk to me about their top four to six qualifications for the job. Um, one thing that's really, really helpful for you to do yourself if you're writing your own resume or for your resume writer if you're hiring somebody to do is to pull a couple, two, three, or even four job postings or job descriptions of um, positions that you would really, really like to go after and pulling out and looking for patterns on keywords and what people are really looking for. And then matching that with who you are and what you can offer. So use the verbiage from your picture brand or keyword list. Um, and then really, you can kind of kill two birds with one stone. You know, your LinkedIn summary can kind of be this, a similar kind of a summary as, as, as is on your resume. Maybe not using the exact same words, but having the same um, content sort of thought in mind. And the most popular and effective resume almost everybody uses is what we call the combination chronological functional, which is the top third of your resume is why you're the best darn candidate for the job. And, the, and the, the, the rest of it is um, just backing up why you're the best candidate for the job and documenting your work experience. A couple of tips. 
and we're running out of time, I know, because I want to answer some questions that you might have. Uh, concise, concise, concise. You know, almost every one of us has short attention span these days. Um, so if you don't capture uh, my attention in the first six seconds uh, of looking at your resume, you're not going to capture it for, the, for reading the rest of it. So uh, one page is good, not necessarily always appropriate. Don't use a pre-made template. Again, use keywords. Um, don't use, don't do things like phone next to your phone number. People know what that is, or email next to your email address. Uh, we hardly ever use objectives on resumes anymore. Uh, more more or less now, the modern approach is to use a headline. For example, biochemist, or uh, packaging engineer, or account executive. Um, Ask for help from other people. Ask for advice and support. Have somebody who can proofread, check for errors, omissions, punctuation. That's probably the biggest thing and it'll get you eliminated. Um, and then ask somebody who knows you really well. Does this, do you think this represents me well? And then use the industry standard, which is um, Microsoft Word. And yes, you really do need a cover letter because really it's another opportunity for you to um, talk about your unique value proposition. Um, to employers. So basically got three paragraphs. Um, you can do it via email, snail mail, or online application. Kind of the same, same thing. Who you are, where you found the position, why you're so great, and ask for an interview. Be proactive. A lot of people don't follow up, so the fortune is in the follow-up, folks. So always, always, always follow up. If you're doing a networking thing, follow up. If you haven't had an interview, follow up. If you've applied, follow up. If you haven't heard, what do you do? You get on the phone, you follow up. And then while you're waiting, you can keep on managing your career by doing some of the other things on the list. Um, Short and sweet here, related to online job applications, and we're going to, again, talk about this next week, too. But almost everybody now uses um, applicant tracking software to screen resumes. Your resumes aren't going to be looked at by real people. They're going to be screened through software, and it's going to be mostly by the number of keywords that you have in your resume that match what they're looking for. So I've had employers tell me if there's 15 of the same keywords in somebody's resume, they can set that applicant tracking software to, to, to pull out the ones that use 15 or more of the keywords that they're looking for, and then they're going to dump the rest of them in the big black hole, the big black resume hole. So um, be sure to upload a plain text file because applicant tracking software can't read formatted. Um, documents. PDFs or DOCXs cannot be read. Um, so make sure that you send a plain text file if it doesn't specifically indicate you can send a Word document. As I mentioned earlier, there's a couple of great, great, great resources. Um, careerrealism.com um, is all free. Every resource on there is free. You can learn, there's tutorials about how to set up a LinkedIn profile that are absolutely dynamite. Um, and then my colleague and friend, Laura Lubavitch, wrote, co-authored a book called 100 Conversations for Career Success, which is absolutely super. Um, it's a whole book of scripts, tips, and strategies for um, networking, cold calling, tweeting, connecting on LinkedIn, etc. So um, that's the end of the PowerPoint presentation. I would love to field any questions that you might have at this time. Hey, thanks, Karen. Um, so we have a couple questions that are sitting out here. Uh, Elizabeth asked the question, <clears throat> um, in LinkedIn, they don't let you connect with someone unless you know them somehow. This has made it very difficult for me to network with professionals that are in my desired field. How do I get around this? You there, Karen? Make sure that you're not Hi, muted. Hi, Elizabeth. Still. I'm going to take your question. 
In LinkedIn, they don't let you connect with someone unless you know somebody. Uh, it's made it difficult for me to connect. You're absolutely right. What I would suggest you doing is um, connecting with people in your professional group, join groups, and start connecting. Um, there are scripts that you can develop, and but you have to do it through um, through somebody that you might know. So what you could do is find out if they belong to the same group that you do, if they belong to the same, uh, for example, MSU Alumni Association group, that kind of a thing. So it's probably not going to totally answer your question. Uh, but I would do it through people you know and through groups. Uh, Elizabeth also asked, um, in regards to follow-up, what do you say when following up? It always seems awkward. Here's another one. What to say when following up? Always awkward. Um, it depends on the situation, Elizabeth. Um, if it's a networking situation or if you're, you're you're looking for um, following up after you've applied. You can um, email me and we can chat that way if you'd like to do it that way. Uh, Laura's book also covers a lot of that, how to connect with somebody you don't know on LinkedIn. There's lots of scripts regarding that as well. We have a PowerPoint. Yes. Uh, let's see. So Jared wrote, I have a really hard time quantifying my success and I find employers love Here's that. As you How said. do you follow up on an application you filled out online? Sandy, that's a great question. It's important to find out information about the company. You can usually always find out some information about the company and some kind of contact information. And I would follow, even if it's a weak contact, um, try to do it through through that. Sometimes they make it almost impossible to to follow up, but do the best you can. A quick email note, a quick e-note, a quick phone call. Anything is better than nothing. I can't. Okay, Jared, I have a really hard time quantifying my success and I find employers love that, you, that as you said. I work from home, measure success, keeping losses low, but they are not easily quantified because no matter how good I perform, a tornado or other, okay, are there others that do my job so it's very hard to quantify success. Um, any ideas about how to go beyond that? How many clients do you work with on a daily basis? How many, um, how have you co kept costs low? What are your challenges, actions, and results? Um, if you can't keep uh, stats about how much money you saved or how much money you made, you can always try to go with how many people I served, um, um, testimonials, things like that. If you email me, I can also um, dialogue more about you with that. Uh, what is your advice on accepting invitations from people who you don't know? Uh, Carmen, great question. Um, it's kind of a mixed bag on that. Um, a lot of careerists like myself, um, uh, there's two ways you can go with that. You can either accept everybody uh, with the strategy of, of having as many connections as you possibly can. Or you can be selective about it. It's it's completely up to you. I used to be on. I used to err on the side of, of uh, accepting only people that I knew or knew or had a connection that I knew. But now I connect with everybody because I find that it's a small world, and I can gain benefit, and everybody else can by connecting um, with people that I don't know.
Yeah, no, Lisa, I can hear David when he speaks for some reason. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? I don't know how to get to the first slide. My email address is Karen at the resume strategist dot com. Connect with me on LinkedIn if you'd like. I'd be happy to connect with you. Email me with your feedback and your thoughts and your questions. I'll stay on the line here for another few minutes in case you have some additional questions you might want to field my way. It's been a pleasure serving you today. I really, really look forward to, um, to your feedback and uh, in your connections, hopefully, and also coming back next week to talk about resumes, LinkedIn profiles, and more. Thank you, Karen. Um, I really appreciate the content that you just shared. And as Karen said, uh, next week she'll be back on January 29th. That's next Thursday, 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the title of her, her uh, Thanks, topic everybody. Week, her topic I'm glad it was week, helpful. Her topic next week will be what's new in resumes, LinkedIn, and more. Uh, with that, we'll conclude the vis the audio portion of the presentation. And I will leave the chat room open if you have questions for Karen moving forward. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Go green. I can hear you.